Um, I am very fortunate in being handed the task of moderating the session, which means I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> but we have a very esoteric panel here today. And uh, I just want to, before I go to each of you asking why you read and more important what you read, um, just some ground rules, which is that I know we all read our text messages, our WhatsApps, our uh, Facebook um, timeline, our Twitter threads and so on. So we're not talking about any of that, right? We are talking about reading books. I trust all of you read books. I know you write them, but you read them as well. Because many people these days say, I don't read, I only write. Okay. We are not Naipal types. <laughs> okay. So that condition having been said, I'll start with Dr. Paul, who is, um, as we just heard, um, not only a renowned doctor, but also uh, an evolutionary biologist and a philanth philanthropist, right? Yes, I think here I'm really a writer. I write both fiction and non-fiction. So yes, I think so please. I, my identity really is as a humble writer. <laughs> Great. A and I think if you're asking the question, I really think it's impossible to write without reading. Uh, I, I really think writing a craft is no different from developing any skill like my view on it really, I've said this in the past, I think the writer's block is part laziness. And I really think w you have to write every day and some days you write good stuff and then some days you write rubbish as you know, but overall it turns out it's like practicing tennis or something. And I think it's the same with reading. I think if you don't read, if you've never read, I don't think you can actually be a writer. Most writers who say that, that at some point they would have been really voracious readers because I think if you're a reader you're developing the craft by looking at other people and I think in my view in any skill development you always start off by wanting to be like somebody else or copying somebody else but I really think finding your voice is the key in any art form be it writing or painting or whatever and I, and to find your voice, you read many different things, so you're not just influenced by any one person, and eventually you find your own. So to me, it's really um, reading is a natural part of being a writer. But that's not the only reason you read, is it? That's right. I mean, I read simply because I love the, you know, the spoken word, and I love the fact that one of the other things I do also I read, of course, for myself, but I also read to other people. So I, one day a week I teach writing to children who can't read and write properly. So, so you're reading different books so that you're able to teach them. But I think fundamentally it's the love of the written word. It's how words can transform people's lives. And, and the fact that if you don't have the written word, even if it is in different forms, you can't participate in society fully. You often miss out on a lot of things. Okay, we'll come back to you, of course. So, Lake, what do you read and what makes it special? Um, lately, I read mostly to learn. Not to enjoy, essentially, not essentially to enjoy what I read, but, you know, like uh, um, one of those famous journalists whose name I don't want to say here, but Mr. M.J. Akbar, you know, used to say that, you know, I learn a lot of things reading and so reading the primary uh, priority is to learn but which is what when you look back when you were in school first you or bef before school you started reading because you wanted to learn you know and later on in my case personally to escape from that learning process which is uh, uh, you know what you can straight jacket and say you learn so that you uh, later appear in exams and you write about uh, what you learn and you know this is a safer zone where you escape from the torments of uh, learning you know reading to just learn this is how I started learning and then now um, the kind of books you know to answer directly the question the kind of books I read are mostly on right-wing movements uh, I also read uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, especially uh, the one that became uh, bestseller you know, uh, uh, on how to twelve ways to live. Um, uh, I, but I do find time to read fiction because it 
allows you to go back to what you always wanted, you know, when you started reading differently, things that you, that were not part of the syllabus, which was to, you know, treasure words, the magic of expression that you find, you know, like one of those first things when I read, you know, that there are things that stick with you, there are words and expressions that stick with you. Yeah. There is one thing uh, about uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, because, you know, as uh, someone who started reading him at a young age, you know, there is something uh, that you can pick up from any of his books and it's so universal because, you know, like I was, recently I was uh, advising a friend who had a breakup and then uh, he was having um, certain kind of drugs. So I told him, you know, there is a quote from Marquez that, uh, um, no medicine can cure what happiness cannot. So you somehow do something that make you happy. So these are the things that, you know, literature in a way reflects life in a way and nothing else uh, reflects life. So which is why I think, you know, like um, there's also another part that I want to bring in here. The why I read uh, can be differentiated into two things. Why I used to read and why I still read because after Netflix has come in, it has become very difficult to stick to reading because what I do is uh, when I want to read, you know, if, if you want me to speak on this something which is not part of the question but I want to complete that because, you know, the whole question can be seen differently, you know, like why I used to read, I used to read for the pleasure of reading and also to learn. You know, it's, it's you can't wish away the fact that uh, you have to read a lot of things so that you can use, that are useful to your work. But then when there is that kind of a transaction involved, you might not love the whole process of reading. You might, perhaps you might enjoy more when there is not that kind of a transaction involved in which you love you read only for the pleasure of reading. And um, somehow I place that kind of a pleasure above the pleasure of reading to learn and apply it in, uh, you know, the kind of work we do. So now it has changed because, you know, you get hooked to Netflix because I keep uh, binge watching things like, you know, the latest was Dogs of Berlin or, you know, something called You on YouTube, on Netflix. So. And then I realized it doesn't make me very happy. That you binge watch, you are contented, you enjoyed it while you did it, but afterwards you are not happy because you want to get back to reading. So what I did was, you know, I, I went and watched, uh, before I read a book um, by Simon Sebag Montefiore on Stalin, I watched Man of Steel in uh, on Netflix. So then went back to read uh, the uh, the young Stalin and also uh, st at the court of the Red uh, which is Stalin uh, when he became, you know, so-called statesman and a politician and a tyrant after that. So it has become for me now uh, video enabled or Netflix enabled reading. So I still read because it makes me happy despite Netflix, you know, despite me getting hooked to Netflix. So that's how I look at it. and I read a lot of books, especially by, um, you know, especially classics. I still read the Joseph Conrad. I try to read um, Indian classics. I read a lot of books in regional languages that are translated into English. Uh, one of my favorite writers is, yeah, definitely Joseph Conrad. Okay, then we'll come back to Conrad and of course, Garcia Marquez is known as the greatest writer in Malayalam, isn't he? <laughs> yes. Um, tell us about what you read for pleasure and not for information. As you may be knowing that I am a poet, I seriously read poetry. I don't read uh, now much of uh, you know, fiction because uh, fiction doesn't give me that kick, basically. You know, uh, I read for kick. Uh, Explain. What do you mean? Kick, kick means a certain line uh, in a poem. Like, uh, if you read uh, a poem by um, Arun Koletkar, the poem's name is Vamangi. 
Uh, it's in Marathi, but uh, it is ably translated by Mustan Sir Darbi. I don't remember the poem now, but I remember one thing. It, that poem is about Vithal Rakhmani, uh, the deities of Maharashtra. So Rukmini is saying that poetry and she is saying that everybody comes here and uh, they look at Vitoba and they go away. They don't ask for me. And you know, like uh, from last 28 yugas, I've been looking at my right. So my neck is now, you know, can't turn this way. So, I mean, I could not explain this to pro you properly, but that the, that's the line. That's the line for... I got... It's key because uh, uh, that's only one poem uh, written in whole of Marathi where woman is telling her story and that too very powerfully and simply and the kind of pain she is going through for last 28 yugas. So that is what the key is basically. And some, some lines like uh, there is a poem. It's about poetry. Written by Tukaram. Words are the only jewels I possess. Words are the uh, something like that. I forgot the poem again. That poem, that poem gives me kick, basically. And that's why I think every day I search in the in night mostly, I go through poetry till I get that kick or that poem from many languages I can read in Marathi, Hindi, English, some Gujarati and some other translations in all these languages. And I have found out that Poetry is this thing which poetry can give me pleasure, can give me kick. But I must tell you, when I started reading, uh, I come from a very small village. I shipped it to Bombay. So my mother tongue and my language of uh, reading was Marathi. So when I came to college, my English was very bad. So I started reading to improve my English. Basically, it was like reading uh, uh, Ayn Rand and uh, Frederick Forsyth and uh, all these writers to whom, I mean, I don't consider them now uh, that kind of writers. Are you really mentioning Ayn Rand and Frederick Forsyth in the same sentence? Uh, of course, because I don't get kick out of them. I mean, in my opinion, in my opinion, what? I, I don't get kick actually. You guys read Ayn Rand and Frederick Forsyth? <laughs> no, no, no. They must have read I, I already. Have it's like for youth. No, okay. When I was reading that time, I was around... When you were 16, you think Ayn Rand is the greatest thing to have happened, right? Yes. And then at 17, you say, what the hell did I just read? <laughs> but the, uh, the, the book recently uh, I read, The Blindness. I mean, somebody told me that this book is... Uh, Blindness? Saramago. 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 Mm. So somebody said, this is uh, like poetry. So I read it and I really loved it. Because in my case, I have not... Uh, I could not go beyond 150 pages of uh, greatest novelist you call uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's oh, no. Oh, no. 100 Years really? of Solitude. Not, not, yes. not good. And I didn't get that You can feeling. always keep trying. Yeah, talk to him. <laughs> keep trying. Yeah, of course. And, up, and secondly... He's saying uh, it's not as good as poetry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my... I'm, uh, I'm a poet. I'm a poetry publisher. Maybe I have a lot of love for poetry. And that's how, if I don't get that kick there, I have to keep it outside. I mean, I can't no, waste my I, time. I, I would be careful saying too many bad things about Garcia Marquez. In no, no, I'm not saying bad. <laughs> in my opinion, I could not cross 150 pages. Ah, fair, fair. So what to do? That's why you live in Maharashtra. He, he, he considered <laughs> him uh, honorary Malayali. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's why he doesn't live here. Uh, that's... Okay, so uh, but I'm intrigued by the fact that you um, you don't get that same kick as you said from anything that's in prose. No, no if there are things, but normally I've got uh, kick from the poetry. Okay, do you tell of us? Of course, about I get kick from scroll articles also, uh, well, but no, not no, that. No journalism here. No, you can also talk about your you know about uh, your reading habit and. Um, 
what are the books that you okay. read away? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I just read compulsively. I read books compulsively and uh, I, I, fortunately, I don't, um, I'm not addicted to Netflix or anything um, that is actually pretty good but sucks up your time. Um, but increasingly, I read because of what, it, what the written word does to with language. Because I find that everyday stories are no longer interesting because you're getting enough stories and more on social media. But the way writers and poets work the language is incredible. I mean, I was planning to uh, read a little bit from a novel by Ali Smith. This is how she um, begins her, I'll just, yeah. Um, sorry. Yes, this is how Ali Smith begins her novel Autumn. It was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. Again, that's the thing about things. They fall apart, always have, always will. It's in their nature. So an old, old man washes up on a shore. He looks like a punctured football with its stitching split, the leather kind that people kicked a hundred years ago. The sea's been rough. It has taken the shirt off his back. Naked as the day I was born are the words in the head he moves on its neck, but it hurts too. So try not to move the head. What's this in his mouth? Grit? It's sand. It's under his tongue. He can feel it. He can hear it grinding when his teeth move against each other, singing its sand song. I'm ground so small, but in the end I'm all. I'm softer if I'm underneath you when you fall. In sun I glitter, wind heaps me over litter. Put a message in the bottle, throw the bottle in the sea. The bottle's made of me, I'm the hardest grain to harvest. That's poetry, right? Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's what writers do with language now that fascinates me. Where they're stretching it, they're bending it, they're playing with it. And information is the least of their concerns anymore. They're creating an entire affect, uh, a sensation in you, which I don't think any other medium can do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So I want to know from both of you whether you've got... I like this idea of a kick. So what have you read that gave you a kick? You couldn't sleep at night after that. I think there, there are quite a lot of... They like you, I read quite widely. And I think it really depends on... I don't watch much TV at all. So really, again, so writing... Reading becomes almost a form of meditation as does writing. So I really think most of the things I pick up, you will always find... I actually think most good writers, I mean, there are obviously some writers whom you just can't get into, you mean, open it and you just somehow can't get into it, that's okay. Because I think, first thing about... The are good you talking thing about James Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think in writing, it's, it's about the honesty there, and I think that's actually okay, because when I teach writing, one of the things I say to people is, you don't think about the reader, you know, you have to really write for yourself. Because... In life, you always accept that your style of writing is, not, be it poetry or prose, I mean, I've written poetry, but it's not for everybody. You know, some people prefer type of poetry, meter or not. Some people may not want their rhymes. Whatever it is, same in prose. You know, many people, what you read now is really beautiful because I write literary fiction, but people are more used to just reading genre like thrillers or who want the fast will think, was she wasting so much time explaining all that? So I really think, I, I can't say, if I continue reading something, I really enjoy it. So, you know, quite eclectic like you. So actually when I was traveling here, I was re-reading re the um, sense of an ending, you know, Julian Barnes one. And I think it was really good because it's a psychological plot in it, but it's a very simple thing, but how it keeps getting twisted out of shape. And also, um, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be, sometimes it can be even short stories. Sometimes you find, I've, I've read a book, uh, you know, Jidu Mopazan's short stories. And again, many of them very simple plots, but the way he weaves somebody's imagination. So half the time you think, is it really happening or is it in the person's head? And I really think if you step back in, like I said, you can't separate reading and writing as much, but the key thing you look for in any story is, you know, the, how the writer sets the context as you just read in Ali Smith's one. And then you develop each of the characters and the resolution of the conflict is a key part in each story for the writer. And when I read, I really look at and marvel at some of the ways they've done that and I really think, wow. And sometimes it comes back, you read your own stuff, which I hate reading except when you're coming to, because you always think you could change it. But before I came here, I was 
at JLF and had a few sessions and they also had a session on my fiction and hadn't read my novel for years and I wanted me to do a little reading so I thought I'd better carry one on the plane to see. Actually reading through it and there was a line from, two lines from one of my novels called The Kite Flyers and one was that dreams belong in the clouds, clouds if not we won't move mountains to reach them and a father tells the son and there was another line which says that tunnels are like childhood friendships are like tunnels into a past one must not ask questions in a tunnel because they echo too much and I remember when I read that I thought hey did I write that you know that's pretty cool you know but because sometimes you write good stuff and but you can actually marvel at or the, the turn of phrase or what you and I think for me that's the enjoyment like what you call the kick I mean I'll, every time I'm reading it's where that you get perhaps I'm more, not as selective as you are, so maybe I get many more cakes out of this, but you're reading many books and you think where they express something like that, and I think, hey, you know, that's pretty cool. But does the, does the writer in you interfere with the reader? Not as much at that time, it's more, I think, I think that's what I mean, I think it probably did more in the early days, and I think when you start out writing, when before you found your own voice, you read that and you think, that's cool, I want to write like this. Then you read another one. And I think then you are constantly thinking about the yeah. process. But I think now it's more you're reading for enjoyment, for meditation, for relaxation. So I, I think it doesn't, I think it only, if anything, it adds to the fact that you can appreciate how others do it as well, better than you. So, Ulek, you, you write on politics. Yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned Conrad. Mm -hmm. So, does Conrad feed into your writing or do you just read him for other reasons? He might, you know, at a subcon subconscious level, I think he, he I mean, uh, because English is not my first language, it's neither. Any, in, uh, who, is it your first language? It you depends know? Yeah, in it India, depends it's, hard, in to India. Say, it's right? hard to say. But, you know, look at J Joseph Conrad, for him English is, was his fourth or whatever, fifth language. So, but he somehow became uh, the master of English prose. So, it, the fact is that you, you've you been reading so much of Conrad uh, and also the plots that he creates in journalism, you know, primary thing that uh, I do is journalism and, you know, this, it, this is just um, writing on politics or writing political books is, uh, is what you do once in a while, you know, once in two years or once in three years or something like that. So, I'm sure that, you know, the idea of creating a plot or idea of creating, a, 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 you know, who, uh, getting the reader, you know, to connect with the reader, you know, which you don't often do in journalism, you know, when you write reports, that you end up doing in, uh, in uh, your books. So, I think, uh, to you know, certain kind of like Heart of Darkness, you know, is, is a novel that cannot be imitated in, in any which way. But he inspires you to create plots of plots and subplots in whatever you write. You might not be successful, but you definitely are inspired by that. But much more than uh, Joseph Conrad, I find um, uh, Svetlana Alexievich. Uh, uh, especially, uh, I was reading a book which is not that very uh, well known of uh, works. Uh, maybe it's, you must have read that, the unwomanly phase of war, World War Two. So she uh, she captures each and everything to the detail. You know, like you know, picks up each and everything. And you know, there is a scene in which uh, uh, you know a man and a woman, both soldiers, have been fighting for uh, days and months and years and finally they reach uh, reach Berlin and where uh, in World War II they win. Red Army wins and uh, uh, hoist the uh, flag of the, uh, the Russian flag. And then the first thing the man out of, uh, you know, it, it's easy to capture certain uh, psychological, uh, it's not easy to capture certain psychological aspects at that point of time and the man man does what he's best known for he proposes to her and the woman is thinking you know what is this man all about i love him but at the end of the war and uh, we are so dirty and you know we have just found uh, some kind of a hope and this man wants to say i love you i want to marry you. so she captures things in such a way that it 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 
it it's it's not what we see in Gabriel Garcia Marquez or for that matter even in Joseph Conrad where things tend to be uh, you know what they always characterize as magical fantasy here there is a lot of realism and you know it's easier for people to uh, you know sort of borrow so I think you know I'm more interested uh, uh, I, I'm more inspired by a writer like her you know uh, when I write like him who has found a voice of his own I, I don't think I have found a voice of my own yet so I'm I I I uh, kind of get inspired by every new writer you know I tend to read you know right that means you know good writing uh, writing that uh, can inspire you, you know uh, Jordan Peterson uh, for that matter is not someone who is liked by a lot of people but you know there and one might say that you know his audience or the people that he choose to write about is you know privileged or rather the underprivileged white minority in a certain part of the world but you know it doesn't stop you from getting inspired just because someone writes about you know these are all human beings human nature stays the same which is also the reason why Joseph Conrad whether he's writing about the Congo or writing about the mariners or uh, writing about different languages or in his late style you know wondering what language will his grandchildren uh, what la language of his will the grandchildren understand when he's wondering and writing about that you know everything is about human nature they tend to uh, inspire continue to inspire you in whatever thing that you write and you know I'm hopefully I'll find a voice one day and then I may not I may start reading them just for the pleasure of reading it and not to uh, treasure the magic uh, that the that weaving the whole exercise of weaving of words by these great writers create uh, one thing I want to answer you know uh, you know I want to just respond to what Hammond said about uh, about you know poetry you know I'm not uh, you know personally I'm not a poetry poetry person I seek poetry even in prose uh, and I'm not someone who has read a lot of poetry except that you know for the purpose of learning and you know the reading was especially uh, for learning and writing exams when it came to poetry but there is so much of poetry um, not just in Marquez's you know I empathize with him you know that I have to say <laughs> with him and, with him <laughs> okay so but you got past 150 pages yeah. Of course, <laughs> I've read. You know, the, there are books that have to be reread, not just read. Right. Yeah. But I think that is a work that is to be reread. And another book, you know, that I I I, said, I recommend that you read is uh, the Time of the Hero by um, Vargas Llosa, Mario Vargas. Mario Vargas Llosa. Because you know, I went to a school uh, which is here in Trivandrum called Sainik School. It's like a mili it, it used to be. It still is like a military school where, you know, there's a lot of ragging, a lot of brutality, bullying and everything. So the time of the hero is set in a military academy where young cadets come and their whole behavior. Somehow, uh, you, know, you know, I connected immediately and instantly and, uh, you know, like uh, famously in a way uh, with that book. And, you know, there is n everything is raw, stark and the words are also trimmed to bones, but you still see some kind of poetry there. But how do you find that without any poetic flourish or, you know, verbal flourish, you know? That this is an experience that is very, very subjective. So I think, you know, it depends on, you know, like he writes the way he wants to write. Uh, and therefore, the way we read also, you know, there are a lot of, you know, there is a lot of subjectivity involved in what we read. There are books, uh, you know, uh, that were recommended to me um, by a lot of people and I don't want to name the writers because you know some of them are women writers and nothing against women writers because you know like I said Svetlana Alexia which is one of my favorites but there are some uh, very famous women writers I started reading and then I could not complete Emily Bronte including you know could not read beyond a point so somebody might empathize or sympathize with me so I was just kidding when I said that but you know one can always try to read and reread 
that is what uh, you know i've done you know uh, like the fall by albert camo i didn't understand it the first time i read it, I read it i read it you know i i found it a labored reading and then after three or four years i read it again and found it so mesmerizing and it's like how can people have such in depth conversations and understanding of human life and nature and the, the, the similarly is true and you know no one would say that you know like you, uh, you didn't understand crime crime and punishment uh, by, by dostoevsky the first time you read it because it's seen as you know you are uh, uh, low iq or something like that because dostoevsky is such a big thing but so do you think people make up things they say oh i love the book when they didn't even read it or Uh, I mean, it. it's human nature again. You know. <laughs> it, it happens. It, it happens. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are people who have told me that they have read War and Peace three or four times, uh, and James Joyce full all <laughs> of his works. But people keep saying that. But I think you have to be truthful and honest to yourself because you know, reading is something that you read to enjoy. And so uh, he is disclosed, and his disclosure makes him a, a better reader. then when you say that in you know, i i love the uh, work and and then you know okay. without even cr- yeah, crossing yeah i'm going to come back to you with the point you made but i want to go to him and first how do you pick a book to read how do you decide what you're going to read yeah. very difficult actually but now uh, like uh, after reading for so many years especially poetry and i used to read a lot of novels also before so i know for there are some people like i don't ask you but there are people who whom i trust to tell me like sampurna i'll ask her oh, this poet wonderful must read that way uh, we have a group i mean everybody has a group i think i mean i have mario vargas llosa and all these authors are recommended but each and every one but poets are not recommended miroslav or uh, the other poet mr cogito who has written cogito mm, i'm not sure yeah, again polish poet so um, i mean i i can say that these poets come to me through my friends the circle of poets all over um, india and abroad they tell me i this poet you must read and right. that way i reading basically and to find where i can get that thing and of course there are a lot of very bad poets and there are very very good poets also so normally the bad poets are uh, front runners they meet you everywhere but the good poets are very difficult to find have like you, author have, have you met rupi kaur i have not met her uh, she was there last year in at jlf i was also there but i am not interested in her writing at all because she writes is what it's it's a thought and uh, nobody writes poetry to improve uh, your handwriting so she is like she improves and writing you know But so people copy her poetry by hand yeah i mean, I mean people write everything she tell her to write lot of things i mean it's like uh, i don't consider her a poet maybe she up to some years she is i think young she is a performer poet, really performer she will uh, later on go to uh, it is very difficult to reach if uh, believer uh, believer of god it is very difficult to reach to god basically it takes time it takes 60 years not like a dying or something but you really take time to reach to some goal and even poetry and practicing poetry or reading poetry or fiction and all i mean i came to the conclusion of not uh, reading fiction because i don't get time now to read that i am basically a full time advertising guy and also poet and publisher and uh, family and lot of Two things lives already lot of lives mm. so one hand i mean i i there is nobody to publish indian poetry in english there was nobody to publish good quality indian um, marathi poetry so it was my task i will publish poetry i'll make it sell and all that so it all comes with uh, but that gives me a lot of pleasure i am doing publishing because it gives me pleasure i get to read a lot of poets and i get to i mean have i have though i have few friends i have got many uh, 
what you call people hate me also because I enemies enemies, <laughs> enemies that's what you mean. yes but that's okay it's part yeah. of uh, your life yes of course yeah I I just forgot to respond to Lake that maybe you just chose bad writers and it was a coincidence that they were women rather than women writers no no I know you're not saying that women are bad writers or anything I know okay I want to ask um, Sharad because both of you have mentioned rereading what makes you reread a book and which are the books you find yourself returning to? I think it can be any. I don't have a specific pattern when I read. And I think it's largely because I think one thing which uh, we didn't say is, of course, the mood of the reader as well. Because I think at different points in life, we may struggle to f finish a book and then we come back to it another time and we actually think, actually, this is pretty good. So I think it depends on whether we're receptive to the message of the book or what the writer is trying to convey and it may be at different points in life where we are or different stages of the day possibly that we are actually not in that space i mean i, I must say uh, like I, I find very difficult like rushdie's fury for example i just could not read it at all right but um I, if i was at any literary event and he heard this he'd probably kill me you know knowing his personality but, but the point I was making is, is just I just could not get into it. And it doesn't mean he's a bad writer or I'm a bad reader. It's just the fact of life that sometimes we'll have readers who can't read our writing. No, no, no chemistry in this case. That's exactly. But what I'm saying is, but at another time when we go back, so what I find rereading is really, I have a little luxury in the sense that, like when you spoke about my philanthropic work, it's really, I teach writing to children and I build libraries for these schools. So. Previously, we used to actually run an ind independent bookstore which funded all these as well. So I have a massive library of books and a lot where of these pre-release ones. This is in New, New Zealand. So, uh, so I have a massive library of these books. So many, so unfortunately, the shelves aren't deep enough. So they're actually like three, three, three deep. So what I find, because it's at my home now, because we, um, so what I find is that often, I would have read it and then I would have been years ago in the back. So I, what I tend to do is I just tend to get the ones at the back to the front and just rearranging them and I just flick through them and then I tend to pick them just on exactly what you said. I flick through them and find a line which I think, hey, this is good. Then I say, let's just read this again. So that's how I went back to Sense of an Ending. I did like it the first time I read, but I was just pulling it out the other day and I was I actually was putting them in order. I had is short stories, on, I think that lemon tree or uh, something under the lemon tree it must oh, be. Which is where we are, roughly. That's it. Yeah. I think that was his latest one. And I had that and I was next to it was Sense of an Ending. So I opened both and then I thought, actually, let me just re... I just found that plot little, you know, the way he had entwined it. You never knew uh, which was real and which was a fictional world till you got into it. So I then ended yeah. up go going back and reading. So, so sometimes it's like that you just go back rereading for not with a plan, but just what where the mood takes you. Yeah, yeah. No, I have my own theory about rereading. You know, people say that you reread a book and you get something quite different from it. But for me, I read it for exactly reliving the old experience. It's like listening to a very familiar, much loved piece of music which one we return to because we know what it will do to us and we want that to happen again, right? So for me, very often, like reading Woodhouse, for example, you read Woodhouse because you know exactly you know what there. you're going to get uh, from it. So, yes, um, um, I, what's the time? How much time do we have? Some Five minutes. Questions Five minutes? Questions. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's time for questions. I mean, I have plenty more, but I'm sure there are people here who might have something to ask anyone. I uh, really like your writings. I just wanted to ask one question. How do you manage to do so many different things which have nothing to do with poetry and still be able to write, uh, write poems? Because, um, because the drudgery of this day-to-day -day work and the fact that a uh, lot of it also seeps into your poetry. Are you ap apologetic about that? Do you like it that way? Or would you want to be transported into a different world where you are away from all of this and just write? No, no, no. Actually, I love life uh, and I actually use a lot of uh, contemporary uh, images because basically uh, I want to be a different than that of whoever has written poetry in thousands of years. I may not be, but I try to be different. I have tried to be different. 
secondly if i don't write i will go insane really because with writing only i can keep calm writing and reading basically poetry that's why i said poetry because it is i know that like going back to some same poems of dilip chitre arun kolatkar and many others i when i go back i feel calmness i i don't look at my poetry because there are there is paranoia there is depression there are a lot of things in my poetry which i also sometimes i don't read my poem the poems of illness because i i know i mean if i read that i will go back to the 20 years when i was going suffering basically so i don't read my poems but i read others poems to get the calm ness otherwise my life is a mess basically but it's like everybody's life is that way and to make sense also uh, out of it i actually write and read thank do, you do, do you you said write for yourself not for the reader do you believe that yes i think so i think really you only find your voice really when you write for yourself i think afterwards you know i think it's different if you're writing genre fiction like if you're writing thrillers or romance then you write for the reader um, more than in literary fiction because there the plot is everything the writing is secondary so in a lot of times you may see da vinci code or something the writing may not be so good but people really go for the plot mm. you know they can me uh, repeatedly those books are top sellers and they've watered the worst writing but they because the people and and in fact uh, to give you an example a good friend of mine she's one of the world's best selling romance novelists and she lives in new york and she was saying that i was teasing her saying that because one year there was all werewolves as characters and one year there were vampires and so they produced like seven books here and they all have the same theme and she was saying actually the publisher determines what the theme is and you know that there's a trope for if you're writing a romance there's a hero there's an anti-hero both competing for the female and that's generally what the reader looks for so when the reader reads that the reader wants there's the hero who is the other guy competing for me and me so that's when the the women reader typically reads them more looks for it and if they don't find that they won't like the book so never mind how good your or beautiful your writing is so so what i think is but if you're writing literature or poetry i think for you have to write for yourself you have to bring your soul out and and i think you have to lay yourself bare and i think that's why i agree with you like you know during my day is very busy i'm working with um you know skin cancer mostly so you're doing reconstructive work so you you know you got 10 12 hours days where you're reconstructing so you high adrenaline because you can't afford to make a little mistake come home you finish all your family duty everybody's gone to bed and then i find my quiet time let's say 10 to midnight and that's when it's really almost like a from unwinding from the day and b from as a form of meditation as well mm. so but that's a bit worrying i'm going to be a bit mischievous but you know if you're writing to calm yourself then you then it shouldn't matter to you whether anyone reads you or not because your purpose is served Absolutely. so that's that's worrying because that means if all literary fiction is only written for the writer then who's going to read they're all going to watch net binge watch netflix Yeah I think that yeah, to I some think. degree that's happening and that's why people are watching it I haven't <laughs> got into Netflix but 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 to give you a story that's true I'll tell you so my first novel was what happened was I wrote it and I sent it off to an agent and I said to her you know I think I can write but I don't know you know surely everybody who writes also thinks they can write so is this any good or not I said I'm not writing with any thing thinking it's great I don't want it to be like only myself and my family thinking but she just gave it to a reader and 10 days later pick it or you care bought it so things just go on so I think you have to write for yourself and then if you find a readership it's a bonus and then you get the connection and then it goes on but you can't then start writing just for those readers because you still have right, to be experimental right, yes okay we are going to end here but I'm going to take 30 seconds more to ask each of you for one book recommendation for our read, for our listeners one book that you would like to recommend that people should read I mean of course I will not yours no no of course not <laughs> I don't like my own <laughs> book uh, I would recommend uh, if you can read marathi you can read uh, arun kolatkar cha kavita or if not then uh, essays tuka poems of tukaram in english translation you will really 
wonder you know how a poet in 16th century wrote wonderful poetry in the name of god but it's about life okay thank you ullek amsterdam by ian mckeown ian mckeown from amsterdam great sharad i i'm actually say at the moment one of the things i like is i'm reading a little more non fiction at the moment and i think i like sapiens by you know yogan and harry because yes. i think it's just the story of humanity and my interest in evolution biology so i think it's a good book right thank you so that's three books you should buy and read right away thank which, you everyone which 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 book you recommend because that uh, that will give me <laughs> one more book to read okay Please. um right now i would recommend a book uh, named adele by leila slimani which i just finished okay she is the writer of um, uh, lullaby and this is her first novel thank you